Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, host and head bookologist here at the Get Literate Podcast. I'm a book-loving, notebook-hoarding reader and writer on a mission to change lives one book and one notebook at a time. On this podcast, we explore the power of bookology and leading literate lives. We talk all things books and reading and notebooks and writing mixed in with mindful practices and creativity to create lives we love. You can expect regular weekly episodes focused on three books you need to know about on a bookish theme and how to bring those themes to life in our actual lives too. You can also expect author interviews, notebooking inspiration, and topics to help us grow through what we go through and take inspired action to make our lives better. So grab a notebook and your TBR list and let's get literate. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Get Literate podcast. I'm Stephanie, your personal bookologist, here with another episode on how reading and writing can make life better. But in order for reading and writing to make life better, we first must make time to read and write. So I want to talk to you today about a common readerly dilemma. I don't want to reveal quite what it is just yet, because I think you need the backstory to get behind it. Because what I originally thought was my reader problem wasn't my problem at all. So I have been reading the same book for almost two weeks. The same book for almost two weeks. And no, this isn't an incredibly long book. Um, No, I haven't been too busy to read. I just haven't been able to get into the book, even though I really, really want to. And not only that, I have found that because I am juggling reading for my Kid Lit Love podcast and all of the amazing interviews I do there, I've had to start and stop and start and stop this particular book multiple times because I am not a book polygamist. I really cannot read more than one fiction book at one time without crossing up my storylines. So I've had to put the book aside, read a different book and come back to it. And it's been harder and harder and harder to get back to it. Not only that, but the print is fairly small. And so there is a lot of text on the page of this decently sized book, I would say. So I was commiserating with a bookish friend. Thank you, Amy. Which, by the way, if you are not inside our Get Literate Facebook community or our Patreon community, I really highly recommend you join us because the conversations and the friendships we have built there, it's just amazing. And so I was having a side conversation with Amy and she gently reminded me of my own advice (laughs) that it's okay to put a book down. Perhaps this particular book is a book I DNF, I did not finish, or it's a book that I NRN, I just don't read, not right now. And I thought about that for a while and I thought, she's probably right. I need to follow my own advice and it looks like this book just isn't working for me. And so I was going to DNF it, I was going to NRN it, but I told myself I had to read just just a little bit more. I do have this thing about abandoning books. I will abandon books, but I want to make sure that I'm giving the book the fairest shot I can. And so I decided to read just a little bit more. And here's the thing. I liked it. I still like it. I want to read this book, but I just can't seem to stay focused on it. I'm getting distracted by it. And I realized that blaming the book wasn't actually going to help my problem. It wasn't the book's problem. It was me. It was me and my TBR problem. So here's what I figured out after a little bit of digging. And by the way, dig is the one word theme inside my Get Literate Patreon community. And I've been really pushing myself to dig into my reading life, my writing life, my actual life, and figure out how things tick and how I can make them better. 
And I found out that the book wasn't the problem. It was my TBR. I was having trouble with my very, very long, very, very big, stacked too high, too many TBR stacks. And so rather than just lean into the book that I had in the moment and focus on it and be mindful around it and enjoy it, I was rushing it. I was pushing to get through it to get to the next one. I was starting and stopping it to get to the book that I had to read. And I found I was kind of working myself up into a frenzy over my TBR. Now, you may think I'm being a little crazy and I'm going overboard, but you're listening to this podcast for a reason. So I imagine I am talking to a kindred spirit. Why should something so seemingly innocent and helpful in a readerly life as the TBR stress me out? Well, quite frankly, it is my personality. When I have too many things on the to-do list, when I have too many balls in the air I'm trying to juggle, when I have too many things trying to sp take space in my brain, for better or for worse, I end up just shutting down, right? When too many things are important, nothing becomes important. And I find that my brain just says, okay, hit the max, go take a nap for 15 minutes, go outside, like nothing gets done. And so I thought about my actual personality and how I work in my real life. And I asked myself, well, when that happens in your actual life, you have too many balls up in the air, too many things on your really long to-do list. What do you do to cope? And my number one strategy, I've talked about it on the podcast before, way back in an episode on journaling for mental health. And I'll be sure to link that in the show notes. I do a good old fashioned brain dump with a twist. So I get out my notebook and I write every single thing that is on my mind. That could be the bazillion things I need to do, the things that I'm worried about, the things that are taking up space, the things that are coming in the future, whatever it is, I get every single one, no matter how big, no matter how small on the page. Then I get out a highlighter and I highlight those things on the list that I can control. Those are the tangible actionable things that I actually could get a handle on in this moment. I highlight those so those stand out and then I look at the list and I pick one and I do it. Simple as that. But the momentum of just doing that one thing usually puts me back into a good headspace so that I can keep going and tick all of those other highlighted things off the list and then either let go of the things that are not highlighted because I can't control them or worry about them in a different way. Look at them from a different angle. It works every single time. It's one of the things that I always go to in my morning page notebooks. So I wanted to take that same lesson to my reading life because it's not the things on my list that are bothering me. It's not the books on my TBR list that are bothering me. I, I love them. It's my perception of them. It's my perception that there are too many and they're too stressful and they're not fun and I'm never going to get it done. And I just work myself up into a frenzy. And I was bringing that same thing that I do in my actual life to my TBR. So in, in this space, I was actually doing some reverse bibliotherapy, right? Instead of the books influencing my life, my life was influencing the books. So what exactly is the trouble with my TBR? And you never know, this could have something to do with your TBR too. So here are the things that I figured out. The trouble with my TBR that was really messing with my reading life and forcing me to not get the kind of reading done that I wanted to get done. Here's the first problem, and it was the biggest. I have too many TBR lists. I have too many spaces in my life where I record the books I want to read. I use Goodreads and my want to read shelf. I use Amazon. I use Amazon both as the wish list. And sometimes I just fill my cart and save things for later. I have a list in my notebook. It's tucked into the back of books that come up that I want to read. I also have a section on my bookish spreadsheet, right? My digital Google Sheets. There is a tab of books I want to read. 
I also use my Kindle and my Hoopla account as a TBR. There are so many Kindle books there that I don't even remember how they got there. And there are books that I take out on Hoopla and I hope that seeing the app on my phone will remind me to read them, but that doesn't always happen. I have stacks and piles of physical books, both on my bookshelf in multiple rooms of the house, all over my office in the basement. I've got a TBR list on my phone. It's a TBR album, or I just take pictures of the books that I see in bookstores or Target or a, a book that a friend is recommending at a book club. And I also use my library holds list as a TBR. Okay, you should not have this many TBR stacks. I should not have this many TBR stacks. When I really counted it up, I had eight. I have eight places where I have books that I want to read. If I had eight different to-do lists scattered around the house or in different locations of my life, and the items on those to-do lists were each different, I would go crazy. And that's what was happening in my reading life. There were so many books to get to, but I felt so disjointed and like I was missing some and disappointing other people and falling behind on book clubs and podcasts and reviews. And I realized it's because I just had too many TBRs. But there's more because regardless of how many TBRs I had, the other problem, and I know you can relate, those TBRs are too long. The digital lists were too long. The digital shelves were too big. The actual shelves were too big. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of books. And I know you can relate. I know some of you listening right now have a Goodreads want to read shelf that towers mine. Currently, as of this morning, my Goodreads want to read shelf is at 425 books. That's not counting the books on my Amazon wish list or in my notebook, in my phone, on my Kindle, at the library. So there's definitely more, right? That overwhelms me. And I know that there is this wonderful Japanese concept that says you should surround yourself with more books than you could ever possibly read in your lifetime. And I do, but I think having 425 of them, at least just on one list, is a little bit too much. Because what if all that excess, what if all the abundance of books stresses me out just a teeny, teeny bit? And yeah, it does. So too many TBRs. Each of those TBRs are too long when you combine them together. I don't even want to know how many books are there. And here's the third problem. Because they're too long, they're too old. They are too old. We're talking years and years and years and years ago that some of these books were added to my TBR list. I am not the kind of person to regularly revisit my TBR and say, huh, which ones have I read? Let's put a little check mark or a smiley face or a heart scale. Which ones do I not want to read anymore? Cross those off. I, I don't do that. I just keep them all on the list. And here's what I assumed. I assumed that on Goodreads, when I had a book that was on my want to read list, and I ended up changing it to a book I was currently reading and ultimately read, I just assumed it would come off of that list. And what I have found is that that is not always the case. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's a glitch in the system. I don't know if there are multiple versions of the book, and therefore I put one version as want to read and then clicked the other version as read. I haven't quite figured it out, but they don't always switch to the right folder. So I needed to clean up my TBR a lot longer, a lot sooner than I had because all of these old books put on there so long ago, I don't even remember them. I don't remember why I wanted to read them. I don't even remember some of the titles, the author's names. I'm in a completely new season of life than I was when hundreds of these books went on the list. And so that list needs to be updated. I can't possibly read them all, right? Because I know new and different books are going to come my way. And so I want to let some of them go. I need to let some of them go. So I have too many TBRs. 
Those TBRs are too long and therefore those TBRs are too old. But here's something else I figured out while I was digging into this TBR mess and figuring out how to fix it. I have too many or I'm not balancing well enough my reading obligations. Think about that for a minute. My reading obligations. What are your reading obligations? What do you think of when I say that phrase? For me, I have, at least currently, four different reading obligations. Number one are those books that I want to read. That's a wonderful reading obligation to have, right? They are books on my TBR because me, myself, and I want them there. My second category of reading obligations are the books that someone else wants me to read. They were recommended to me. And therefore, I feel like I should read them because I trust these people that are recommending these titles. And I am quite certain that I would want to read it too. My third category are the books that I think I should read. The bestsellers that are coming out. The books that I happened to see while flipping through the bookstore that a bookseller said was amazing. I feel like I should read them because everyone else is, or it'll be good for me, or I should stretch my reading life. I'm not sure I want to, but I think I should, and that takes up space in my TBR. The fourth thing that takes up space, and this is definitely, oh, it's a problem more recently, but it's a wonderful problem to have. It's the books that I have to read. It's the professional books that I have to read for work. It's the children's literature that I am reading to get ready for my Kid Lit Love podcast. I absolutely adore reading these books, but if we're honest, I have to read them. I have to read them in order to prepare and have a wonderful conversation. And so when I realized that my TBR was just over the top in a frenzy, and I also realized that it wasn't just the TBR, it was the sense of obligation that I felt around it, right? And when too many things are a priority, as I mentioned, nothing becomes a priority. And I realized none of this felt very good. My TBR didn't feel very good. This idea of reading obligations didn't feel very good. And I wasn't balancing them so much. I was tipping in the wrong direction for too long, right? And the whole idea of everything everything is good in moderation. And my reading life had become unbalanced because of the way I was keeping my TBR. So now you've got the backstory and now you know I am committed to cleaning up my TBR. And I thought you could too. If you are anything like me and any of this resonated, I have a feeling that you might be itching to get into your TBR to see if that helps you just feel better about your reading life. Even if you already feel good, a little cleanup can go a long way. And so today I want to share with you the process that I am currently in the midst of and some of the books that have stayed on my TBR that I'm so grateful to remember that I hopefully will plan to balance out in my reading life in the very close future. So are you ready? Grab a notebook if you want to jot down these steps or Come back and listen to this episode when you are in front of wherever your TBR lists are. And here we go. Step one, gather all of your TBRs. Make a list of all the places you keep titles you want to read soon. I'll just go through the ones that I suggested earlier again. Goodreads, Storygraph. Amazon, a list in your notebook, a digital spreadsheet, books on your Kindle, books in Hoopla or Libby or Audible, the physical stacks of books in your home, the photo album on your phone, maybe the Google Keep list or the Notes app on your phone. Maybe it's all of those library holds right? You may even have other places that you store your TBR books that I'm not thinking of, but I think that gives us a nice wide start. So jot down which ones apply to you. Where do you currently have your TBR lists stored? 
And how do you feel about that number? If you're okay with it, if you are okay with an abundance of TBR lists, then I need to have a coaching session with you <laughs> because I am not. But if you are like me and you don't like how many places all of your books are in, or you just want to streamline just because, then the next thing I want you to do is really think and reflect and maybe create a pros and con list. I want you to choose primarily one TBR option, just one. And so look at the list that you currently have in front of you and think of the pros and cons of each. Which of those work well in your world? Which of them have drawbacks? And which one, if you could only keep one, and I'm going to break my own rule because I'm going to have two and I'm going to tell you why, which one would you choose? For me, I'm choosing Goodreads. I'm choosing Goodreads because I've been there for a while. That is where I have my current highest number of books I want to read on a TBR list. I can access it easily on any device. It goes right to the app on my phone so I can get it when I am out and about as well. And it's just really easy. It's something that I have already built into my routine. I review every book that I've read there. It's it's built in to my reading life. Now I do have this horrible moment of panic where I wonder what would happen if Goodreads goes down, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> so I am choosing Goodreads as my digital TBR. But technically, I want you to have two TBR lists. Your first TBR should be your physical book stack. And I talk a lot about this in my restorative reading course. One of the best ways to remind yourself to read is to have your physical book out in the open so that you see it often. And having a stack of books reminds you that not only do you want to read, but there are more waiting where that came from. So I would love for you to have a physical stack of books in your house for immediate, what am I reading next from my TBR? But then some sort of digital or even analog in your notebook, longer, long-term list for what comes after that immediate stack. So for me, I've got a shelf at home for my TBR bookshelf or my TBR book stack. And then I'm going to use Goodreads as the single place to house them. So that does mean I'm going to have to go through all of the other places I have my titles and transport them to Goodreads. I'm going to open up my phone and the books I still want to keep, I'll put them on Goodreads. I'm going to look at my Kindle. What's there? I'm going to put them on Goodreads. I'm going to go to my notebook list in the back of my book. If I still want those. I'm going to put them on Goodreads, et cetera, right? So you're going to choose one and then you're going to integrate them together. But in order to integrate them together, you have to do step two, which is give a good spring cleaning to your TBR. Now, I don't know if you are an inbox zero kind of person. I am not. I think currently I'm at like inbox 2,789. <laughs> and it really doesn't bother me. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why. I have multiple email addresses and it really doesn't bother me if they're full, but it does bother me that I have a big TBR. So my goal for my TBR, my digital long-term TBR is to be under 100 books. I can live with that number. I feel like it's doable and I could get to that in, in my lifetime. <laughs> maybe you have more, maybe you have less, but I'm settling for around 100. And so now you have to go through all of your lists, as I mentioned, and integrate them. And as you integrate them, clean them out. So for me, one of the best ways to do this is to go to your TBR, and this really only works if it's digital, I guess, although no, what I want you to do is go to your TBR and I want you to start in reverse order. So on Goodreads, I have my TBR shelf set up so that it's in order of the latest book I've added so that I can see really quickly which one I've added recently. But in order to do this spring clean out, I reversed it. So I could see the oldest book 
I have ever added to Goodreads and work backwards. That was eye-opening, my friends. There are books that I do not remember. I have no idea why I would have ever put it on my TBR. It does not interest me in this phase of life. I'm really wondering what headspace I was in for some of them. And I also found, which is a really fun little added perk, is you can see what you were like back then. My TBR goes back years and years and years on Goodreads. And it was so interesting to see, you know, back in 2017, what were you putting on your TBRs, right? It was just a, a really neat way to move through the seasons of my life and see what I was interested at that time. So even if you don't want to clean out, it is fun to click that reverse button and take a trip down memory lane and see if you can remember that version of you based on your TBR. Now, if you have it in your notebook, just start at the top of your list. If you have it in your phone on the album, scroll to the very back, et cetera. So what you might find is that on your TBR list, you have already read some of these books and you just didn't take them off. So go ahead and do that. I had to do that a lot on Goodreads. Switch them to read or remove them. If you don't want to mess with your numbers for reading the books this year, just, just get them off of your list. Then look at what's left and say, do I still want to read it? Is this a book that is still right for me? No, we'll get rid of it. Is it a book that I remember why I wanted to put it on there? No, well, get rid of it. Just give a nice big scrub. One thing you can do in Goodreads, which I'm going to start trying to do, is to edit when I put it on my TBR shelf and put a little private note to myself of why. Maybe who recommended it to me, which site or podcast I heard about it on, so that when I go back to my TBR later, I can quite possibly remember why I wanted to put it on in that moment. So you could do that on Goodreads. You could add that to your notebook. You could jot it down in a digital list. There are all sorts of ways to add in that context, but that's a good thing you might do as part of the cleanup process. If the book stays there, there's a reason. And then pledge that from this moment forward, whenever you add a book to your chosen long-term TBR list, jot a little note so that you remember why. It really helps when it's time to pick which one you want to read next. So step one was to figure out your long-term TBR. Step two was to integrate them together and really swipe through them and clean. Step three was to add a little bit of context for the books that you want to keep and pledge moving forward. You will do that. Here is step four you need to come up with a plan. You need to come up with a plan to juggle all of those reading obligations. So back when I was starting one of my, well, I think it was maybe my third teaching job. Um, I had just applied for a position that I really wanted as a reading coordinator. I got it. And then very soon found out that I was expecting my first child. And I was petrified to tell my boss. I didn't know this woman. I'd only known her for a couple of weeks. Here I am starting this brand new initiative. And oh, by the way, I'm going to be going out on maternity leave soon. So I finally got the nerve up to tell her. And she told me that beautiful glass ball story. She was so wonderful. And she said, listen, we all have multiple balls that we are juggling in life. Work, school. I was in graduate school at the time, our family, our friends, our hobbies, all of the things. And she said, I want you to think of your family and especially your new growing family as the glass ball, right? Everything else is a rubber ball except family, because if we drop that one, we can't get it back. So everything else, it'll bounce back. This job will be here when you come back. Don't worry. Do the best you can while you're here. Go enjoy that new baby of yours and then come back. It was such a wonderful conversation. I just gained so much respect for her and then had a beautiful analogy to take with me. And I'm telling it to you because I think it's a great analogy for balancing your reading obligations. What's your glass ball? 
For me, my reading obligations, if you remember, are books I want to read, books someone else wants me to read, the books I should read, and the books I have to read. So I really have this want, should, must juggling act going on in my mind. And I really want the books I want to read to be that glass ball. It probably should be the books I must read because if I don't read those, then, you know, book clubs could fall apart or podcast episodes might not go well, but I know I'm going to get those done. I'm an upholder. It's on the calendar. I will read it. So I want my glass ball to be the books that I want to read. The books that I know are going to grow my restorative reading practice, be the perfect bibliotherapy books for me. So want, should, must. Think of that for you. Want, should, must. Which one do you want to be your glass ball? Which one has to be your glass ball? How good are you right now at balancing those different categories? For me, the only way to figure out how good I am at balancing those categories and the only way to help me make sure that I am balancing them in the future is to track them. Right? We've all heard that phrase that says where your attention goes, energy flows. You've got to track something in order to pay attention to it and be intentional about it. So I am adding a new category to my bookish spreadsheet. If you don't know about my bookish spreadsheet, if you don't have a copy for yourself yet, just go to alitlife.com, click free literate love on the top, and you will see that you can download my digital bookish spreadsheet for free. I love putting in my titles. I track the titles, the author, the genre, how many stars or hearts I gave it, what format it's in, what audience it's for, what themes did I find. I track all the things because I love seeing those bookish, um, what are they called? Bookish charts, the bookish um, pie charts come to life that tell me about my reading life. And so I am adding another category that simply says, is it a want, should, or must read? And then I can track it and I can see how I'm doing in the want, should, and must read category. And now I'm nerdy, I'm nerding out, but I love it. If you don't have a bookish spreadsheet and you don't want one, you could always do this in your notebook page, right? Next to your TBR, just keep track. Is it a want, should, or must book? And Watch yourself over time. Which ones seem to be getting most of your attention? Which ones do you think should get most of your attention? And just put it on your radar and see how it goes. So I'm primarily going to track that in my bookish spreadsheet, but I think I'm also gonna track it a little bit on my calendar. So when I create content for the podcast for Kid Lit Love, or anything related to my literate life, I usually track it in my content calendar. And I thought I could do that here. Each month when I just quickly capture the titles I've read to get ready for my monthly literate love episodes, I can put a quick note. Is it a want, should, or must read? And that's what I'm going to do too. So I'm going to keep track of it in preparation for monthly literate love and on my digital spreadsheet. And who knows, maybe I will end up being the kind of person who better tracks what she's reading as she's reading it in her physical calendar. I don't do that yet, but I do admire people that do. And I know Amy W., a OG member of the Get Literate community, she has the most wonderful plum paper calendar slash agenda slash notebook that I do plan to get my hands on. So if you have one that you think I'd recommend, tell me those in the show notes or send me a message as well. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've chosen a TBR list, one short-term stack, one longer-term TBR list for planning. We have integrated them together and in the process we have swiped through and we have cleaned them up to be whatever number we want them to be. And we've added context to the books that are left so we remember why we wanted to read it. And we pledged to do that moving forward. And then we came up with a plan on how to balance our want should and must read books. The only thing left to do is read. I just feel better going through that process. I am still working through the muddy middle of cleaning up the TBR and it feels really, really good. 
And not only that, I have found three books that are on my TBR that I completely forgot about that I want to read. And these are the three books that I want to share with you right now. I'm going to tell you the title and author, and then I will read the description from Goodreads because you know that's where I'm housing my want to read books. And since I don't know much about the book, I'm relying on the publisher and the publisher's blurb to keep it front and center. So the three books that are still on my list that are not children's literature, by the way, because I do have a whole nother set of three that I forgot about in, in Kid Lit that I want to read, but I'll save that for Kid Lit Love. The first book is Jodi Picot's The Book of Two Ways. When I looked at this, I thought, I don't remember putting this on. I don't remember this cover. And even as I read the description, I don't even remember the description, but I liked it. And so I knew I put it on there for a reason. So here's the description. Everything changes in a single moment for Dawn Edelstein. She's on a plane when the flight attendant makes an announcement, prepare for a crash landing. She braces herself as thoughts flash through her mind. The shocking thing is, the thoughts are not of her husband, but a man she last saw 15 years ago, Wyatt Armstrong. Dawn miraculously survives the crash, but so do all the doubts that have suddenly been raised. She's led a good life. Back in Boston, there's her husband, Brian, her beloved daughter, her work as a death doula, where she helps ease the transition between life and death for patients in hospice. But somewhere in Egypt is Wyatt Armstrong, who works as an archaeologist unearthing ancient burial sites, a job she once studied for but was forced to abandon when life suddenly intervened. And now, when it seems that fate is offering her a second chance, she's not as sure of the choice that she once made. After the crash landing, the airline ensures the survivors are seen by a doctor and then offers transportation wherever they want to go. The obvious option for Dawn is to continue down the path she's on and go home to her family. The other is to return to the archaeological site she left years before, reconnect with Wyatt and their unresolved history, and maybe even complete her research on the Book of Two Ways, the first known map of the afterlife. As the story unfolds, Dawn's two possible futures unspool side by side, as do the secrets and doubts long buried beside them. Dawn must confront the questions she's never truly asked. What does a life well-lived look like? When we leave this earth, what do we leave behind? Do we make choices or do choices make us? And who would you be if you hadn't turned out to be the person you are right now? Oh my gosh, I want to read this book. I loved it. I love, love, love the description. And because my one word theme for the month of May is dig, dig deep about those big questions about myself and those around me and the world, this book just seems like a perfect fit. And had I cleaned my TBR calendar or my TBR list out earlier, I maybe could have added it to my bibliotherapy book calendar. That's okay. There's always next time. Now, the next one I had, the second I saw this cover, I remembered it. And I thought, oh my gosh, I remember this book because I put it on here at first because of the cover. So the cover is this beautiful blue background. And then there is this very tall rainbow layer cake with vanilla frosting. If you know me, you know I love sweets and you know I have a frosting obsession. And so this cover, I did judge the book by its cover, but then I went deeper into the title and the description. This book is titled The Cake Therapist by Judith M. Burdig. Claire Neely O'Neill is a pastry chef of extraordinary talent. Every great chef can taste shimmering, elusive flavors that most of us miss but Neely can taste feelings. Cinnamon makes you remember. Plum is pleased with itself. Orange is a wake-up call. When flavor and feeling give Neely a glimpse of someone's inner self, 
she can customize her creations to help that person celebrate love, overcome fear, and even mourn a devastating loss. Maybe that's why she feels the need to go home to Mill Creek Valley at a time when her life seems to fall apart. The bakery she opens in her hometown is perfect, intimate, just what she's always dreamed of. And yet, as she meets new customers, Neely has a sense of secrets, some dark, some perhaps with tempting possibilities. A reoccurring flavor of alarming intensity signals to her perfect palate a long ago story that must be told. Neely has always been able to help everyone else. Giving to the end of this story may be just what she needs to help herself. This is just perfect for me. It is a book that is right up my alley. I loved books before that have these themes. Um, there's one, let's see, um, The Sadness of Lemon Cake, where she can taste feelings of the cook that has tasted it. There is another cozy mystery where a character in the book can bake you the perfect scone according to what you need in life just after a conversation. I just love the silly idea of it. So The Cake Therapist by Judith M. Fertig is going, staying, I should say, on my TBR. Now up next is another one that feels so powerful. And the second I saw the title, I remembered that I wanted to read it. It's titled Out of Love by Hazel Hayes. As a young woman boxes up her ex-boyfriend's belongings and prepares to see him one last time, she wonders where it all went wrong and whether it was ever right to begin with. Burdened with a broken heart, she asks herself the age-old question, is love really worth it? Out of Love is a bittersweet romance told in reverse. Beginning at the end of a relationship, each chapter takes us further back in time, weaving together an already unraveled tapestry from tragic breakup to magical first kiss. In this dazzling debut, Hazel Hayes performs a post-mortem on love, tenderly but unapologetically exploring every angle, from the heights of joy to the depths of grief and all the madness and mundanity in between. This is a modern story with the heart of a classic, truthful, tragic, and ultimately full of hope. I don't think I have read another novel, or at least I can't think of one right now, where the book was told in reverse about the relationship between the characters. If you have, send me some titles. Maybe I have and I just can't think of them, but I'm so intrigued by how this would work. I recently read Una Out of Order, and that was that was a harder book for me because I couldn't make much sense out of the comings and goings of, of Una. But I think this will be really cool to take a backwards list at the connection between these two characters. I said backwards list, didn't I? The TBR is on my brain. A backwards look at how these two characters unwinded as as the publisher's blurb said. So those are the three books that I can't wait to read. The Book of Two Ways, The Cake Therapist, and Out of Love. If you have a recommendation of which one I should read first, go ahead and send it my way. And if you want more, if you want to learn more about this process, if you want to hear more about my work behind it, some of the books that may still be on my list. If you need some cheerleading to do your own TBR work, then you might want to join my Get Literate Patreon community. It's only five bucks a month. You get extra bonus episodes every Sunday. You get a first chapter Friday for adults every Friday, and you get a book club and lots of other live and fun events in between. And this month we are exploring the theme, Dig. We are digging into all the things about our reading and writing life, about ourselves, our relationship, the world around us. We're going in deep. And that includes, you might guess, taking a look at some of our TBRs. So I don't know about you, but I feel better. And I feel better because I have a plan to control the frenzy I was feeling about my TBR. And if I can control the frenzy in my TBR, I know that I can make my actual life feel a little less frenzied too. 
inner order leads to outer calm, as Gretchen Rubin says, or no, I got that backwards. Outer order leads to inner calm and outer TBR order can lead to some reader calm too. So here's what I'd love for you to do next. I'd love for you to tell me the status of your TBR. Where do you house it? How many books are on it? What is your biggest TBR trouble? And what's a book that you think I should add to my TBR list too? Now, remember, I'm going to balance my want, should, and must, but I do still want to know what you think I should read because you know it would be right for me. So thanks for listening to this fairly personal and hopefully informative episode on how we can clean up our TBR. I think it's the perfect time of year to do it. It is spring cleaning season, and it will get us ready to jump into a summer reading season that we really, really love. So tell me all your comments, send them to me on social media at Affinito Lit, send me an email at stephanieaffinito at gmail.com or head to the show notes, comment on this episode, and as always, leave an audio message if that works for you too. I love listening to the messages that are sent there. So thanks so much for listening, everyone. And here is to a wonderful week full of reading and writing, and much more manageable TBR lists. I'll see you inside the next episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Get Literate Podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes and at alitlife.com. Plus, if you want more, you might like to join my Patreon community. There, you'll find additional inspiration for your reading and writing life, like bonus podcast episodes, bibliotherapy book calendars, monthly book clubs, notebooking challenges, live events, giveaways, and much, much more. It's only $5 a month, and you get instant access to all of the previous content, too. You can learn more at getliterate.co. And one more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish and notebookish community too. Thanks for listening.